get somebody started. Pam. Pam. The Newlander family, with their picture-perfect appearance and affluent lifestyle, stood as a beacon of happiness and success in DeWitt, New York. Dr. Robert Newlander, a revered obstetrician gynecologist, and his wife Leslie, a celebrated philanthropist, had built a life of envy. They resided in a lavish mansion, every corner of which echoed a life of serenity and prosperity. Leslie, known for her generous heart, spent much of her time on charitable activities, bringing light to the less fortunate. Her empathy and tireless dedication were well known. In contrast, Robert, a dedicated physician, earned the community's respect with his exceptional skills and admirable patient care. The couple had two children, Jenna and Ari, both pursuing their careers and independent lives. The Neulander household often hosted gatherings where friends and colleagues convened, sharing stories and creating memories. However, beneath this bright veneer and opulent life lay secrets and tensions unseen, only to be exposed by an impending tragedy. On the morning of September 17, 2012, Jenna was jolted awake in her quiet room by her father's urgent calls. Confused, she opened the door to a horrific scene. Overwhelmed by the sight of blood, she immediately dialed 911 for help and rushed to aid her mother, following her father into the room. Robert, an experienced doctor, quickly administered first aid. But as emergency responders and police arrived, the Newlander's bedroom turned into a heart-wrenching crime scene. Leslie Newlander was found lifeless. Despite the medic's efforts, all attempts to revive her were futile. As the police began their investigation, collecting evidence and noting details, Jenna and Robert stood in shock and pain, unable to believe how a normal morning had turned into a day of mourning. After confirming Leslie's death, the authorities began questioning Jenna and Robert. Robert, with a pained expression and ambiguous words, provided a detailed account of the events, framing it as a tragic accident. His explanation seemed to align with the scene observed by the police. Jenna, in a state of shock and grief, also believed it to be an accident. The case appeared closed until rumours began to circulate, casting doubt on its authenticity. The tragic news of Leslie Newlander's untimely demise rippled through the community, leaving a trail of shock and disbelief. Among those stunned 
was Mary Jumblick, a close family friend and local resident. The news was particularly jarring for Mary, as just two days earlier, Leslie had been at her doorstep, her voice brimming with optimism, sharing uplifting words about Mary's health. In that moment, death seemed a distant reality, making the news of Leslie's passing all the more surreal. As the days turned into months, whispers and rumours about the circumstances of Leslie's death began to percolate throughout the town. Mary, with her astute mind and a background as a forensic pathologist boasting 11 years of experience, couldn't help but be drawn into the mystery. The swirling doubts and speculations ignited a spark in her, a desire to uncover the truth. Leveraging her professional expertise, Mary put forth a proposal to re-examine the case files, a move embraced by the authorities who recognized the value of her seasoned insights. Delving into the medical reports with a detective's precision, Mary unearthed startling discoveries. The injuries marking Leslie's body painted a picture far removed from an ordinary accident. This revelation sent a chill down Mary's spine, and she knew she had to act. Without hesitation, she brought her findings to the attention of the investigators, igniting a flame that would soon burn bright in the pursuit of justice. Six months into this renewed investigation, the police, with fresh eyes, revisited the Neulanda residence, now a haunting echo of past joys and sorrows. They scoured every inch of the crime scene, uncovering a tapestry of bloodstains that wove a sinister story. Stains hidden behind curtains, smeared across the bed frame, and splattered on the walls. This grim On the cusp of autumn, September 8th, 2006, a Friday that whispered the last secrets of summer, the residents of Lanes 258 in Katan, Hoa Lien, Taiwan, were confronted with a mysterious silence. House number 25, once a hive of activity with a family of seven, had inexplicably fallen into a haunting quiet. The absence of life's usual symphony, paired with a stifling stench, started to unsettle the neighbors. The silence, shrouded with the offensive odor, prompted the residents to reach out to the authorities, hoping for a swift unraveling and resolution of the matter. The locale, however, was no stranger to disputes or mafia gang activities, leading the police to initially overlook the situation. Only after a persistent stream of calls from concerned locals did they decide to inspect the house. As the police arrived, they were immediately greeted by the pungent odor, markedly different from typical sewer smells. With guidance from the residents, they approached the ominously silent Liu family's residence at number 25. Repeated knocks and calls by the village head and police echoed unanswered. With patience wearing thin and the pungent odor serving as the only response, the decision was made to forcibly enter the home. 
With the locksmith's aid, they breached the threshold. The door creaked open to reveal a scene dominated by an overpowering foul stench and flies in morbid attendance. The interior, once alive with the laughter of children, now held a terrifying stillness. A thorough search of the ground floor by the village head and officers yielded no sign of the family or anything out of the ordinary. They ascended to the second floor, only to find it equally undisturbed. The investigation then led them to the third floor. The further ascent was marked by an unsettling increase in fly activity. The flick of a light switch initiated a grim inspection. They encountered a bathroom door ajar. A push against the door was met with resistance, as if something was lodged behind it, and an overpowering stench filled the air. With determined force, the village head and police officers pushed against the bathroom door, steeling themselves for the unknown horrors within. The scene they encountered was beyond nightmarish. Within the confined space of the six square meter bathroom, five bodies were discovered in a macabre heap, each enshrouded in thick quilts. From these wrappings, a dark, sinister liquid oozed, dripping to the floor and drawing a grotesque gathering of flies. The decayed state of the bodies, lying in a grim testament to the passage of time, was the source of the pungent stench that had pervaded the house. Grasping the severity of their find, the officials immediately alerted their superiors, setting in motion a more extensive investigation. In the wake of this chilling revelation, a contingent of police officers rapidly converged on the site. They secured the area, establishing a boundary for what had now become a major crime scene. As they commenced their meticulous investigation, they found that all five bodies were clothed and cocooned in blankets. A more unsettling detail emerged. Several of the bodies had their faces and heads cruelly obscured with beige tape and plastic bags, their forms constricted by ropes. The explicit horror and sensitive nature of these findings led to a decision to withhold further gruesome specifics from public disclosure. The identities of the five victims were quickly established. They were the children of the Liu family. Specifically, the victims were Liu Yusheng, 18 years old, born December 16, 1987. Liu Jingsheng, 17 years old, born November 15, 1988. Liu Guchen, 15 years old, born August 12, 1991. Liu Quan, 12 years old, born November 24, 1993. Liu Bei Sheng, 9 years old, born November 18, 1996. Their cause of death was determined to be asphyxiation. This revelation raises numerous questions about the circumstances and motives behind their tragic deaths. In a meticulous effort to unravel the sinister mystery behind a heinous crime, the police delved deep into investigating the cause and identifying the perpetrator. The scene yielded pivotal clues. Autopsies revealed that three of the five victims had empty stomachs, indicating they were likely killed before a meal, with their demise predating the discovery of the bodies by over three days. The investigation swiftly focused on the Liu family. 
This family, comprising Father Liu Jiqin, born November 25, 1958, and Mother Lin Zhenmi, born July 25, 1971, had moved from Taidong to Hoa Lien. Known for their reclusive nature, they had minimal interactions with their neighbors. A thorough search of their residence revealed that all entry points were secured from the inside, suggesting no external intrusion. Curiously, even the ventilation fan in the third floor bathroom was taped shut, presumably to contain the stench. Among the finds were a used roll of tape and a partial fingerprint. Outside the bathroom, investigators found cigarette butts of a brand different from Liu Jiqin's usual choice. DNA tests on the butts contradicted his genetic profile. Personal documents, mobile phones, and various belongings were discovered undisturbed on a TV cabinet negating the likelihood of a break-in or theft. A distressing clue was unearthed in the living room, a note scribbled on a piece of white paper alongside a 1,000 yuan bill reading, Children are being held in house number 25. Call the police SOS. The handwriting was identified as Liu Jiqin's, hinting at a desperate cry for help. Amidst these findings, the police noted Liu Jiqin's financial woes, leading to speculation that he and his wife could have been potential victims or even the orchestrators of this tragedy. Investigators then turned their attention to the family's social circle, suspecting an acquaintance might be involved. A significant lead emerged when the DNA on a cigarette butt found outside the bathroom was matched to Xiao, a friend of Liu Jiqin. Xiao confirmed visiting the Liu residence over a week prior, but had not returned since. His alibi, corroborated by forensic evidence, suggested the cigarette butts were strategically placed to mislead the investigation. In the days leading up to the discovery, a neighbor reported seeing Mrs. Lin performing tasks usually done by the children, further adding to the mystery. Liu Jiqin, owner of three businesses, was reported to have visited his offices four days before the incident citing a trip to Taipei for his children's surgery as a reason for his impending absence. This cascade of information significantly aided the police in piecing together the case, narrowing the search for the culprit and understanding the context of the five children's deaths. School records for Liu Yusheng Liu Jingsheng, Liu Guchen, Liu Quan, and Liu Beisheng provided crucial insights into the timeline of their disappearance. The discovery that two were still in school uniforms indicated a probable post-school murder. The absence of any signs of struggle or conflict within the house and the lack of suspicion among the dense residential area suggested a covert operation. The physical prowess of the older Liu boys, showing no resistance, pointed to a possibly sedative or paralytic agent used by the assailant. Further forensic analysis identified poisoning as the cause of death, distinct from any sleep-inducing drugs. Variances in the time of death among the victims aligned with the younger children's presence at school on September 5th. A critical finding was a toxic vine containing the lethal compound rotenone at the Liu residence. Its most poisonous part, the root, was missing, raising suspicions of its use in the crime. 
Liu Jiqin had received the vine from a friend for supposedly research purposes. These revelations steered the investigation toward a grim possibility. Liu Jiqin and Lin Zhenmi might have premeditated and executed their children's poisoning. Lin Zhenmi's deceit to the school to keep the children at home, coupled with Liu Jiqin's access to the toxin, led to the suspicion of the parents' involvement in this appalling act. The meticulous analysis of evidence from the crime scene, alongside data from train stations, convenience stores and supermarkets in Hoa Lien, increasingly implicated Liu Jiqin and his wife, Lin Zhenmi, as the prime suspects. Surveillance footage captured them moving with a disconcerting calmness, devoid of any signs of being pursued or coerced. Their purchases, tape, pliers, wire, items eerily aligned with those used in the crime, heightened the suspicions of their involvement. A pivotal piece of evidence emerged. Liu Jiqin's fingerprint, unmistakably imprinted on a tape roll discovered at the scene. In a significant turn, investigators unearthed a digital camera in Liu Jiqin's office. Despite the missing memory card and deleted images, a recovered photo chillingly depicted Liu Jiqin binding his third daughter, Liu Qi Tran, on a bed. While Lin Zhenmi was absent from the frame, the angle at which the photo was taken suggested her role as the photographer. These revelations shifted the nature of the case transforming the missing person's report into an arrest warrant for the couple, signifying a crucial pivot in the investigation's trajectory and a firm resolve to bring the suspects to justice. Liu Jiqin, 48, with a history of three marriages, had found a complicated romantic entanglement with his third wife, Lin Zhenmi. Their paths crossed while working at a hot spring hotel, sparking a swift and intense relationship. In a bold move, Liu Jiqin, while still wedded to his second wife, introduced Lin Zhenmi as his sister at his home. This clandestine affair eventually came to light, culminating in his divorce. Post-marriage, Liu Jiqin and Lin Zhenmi encountered stiff resistance from her family. Despite this, Lin Zhenmi's allegiance remained unwavering. She kept in touch only with her third sister, Lin Qiugui, owing to the tense family dynamics. Liu Jiqin's refusal to adhere to traditional kneeling rituals following the death of Lin Zhenmi's parents only exacerbated the familial rift. The couple's relocation to Hoa Lien marked a period of seclusion for Liu Jiqin, where he led a reclusive life. Strictly managing his family affairs and increasingly distancing them from the local community, under the guise of familial harmony, the Liu household was silently grappling with a financial crisis. Burdened with an overwhelming debt of 16 million Taiwan dollars, roughly 600,000 USD, across 17 credit cards, they were caught in a vicious cycle of borrowing from friends and relatives for various needs, ranging from their children's education to business ventures. However, three months before the catastrophic event, their financial woes reached a breaking point, leaving them incapable of debt repayment. 
A confidant of Liu Jiqin disclosed a haunting premonition he once shared. If he couldn't settle his debts, the survival of his entire family was in jeopardy. Alarmingly, just a week before the tragedy, he ominously hinted to a neighbor about a forthcoming horrific murder on their street, a statement initially dismissed as jest, but now holding a grim foresight into the fate of his five children. Meanwhile, Lin Chugui, Lin Zhenmi's sister, reminisced about a distressing call from her sister 11 days earlier. Lin Zhenmi's tone was laden with despair and despondency. Concerned, Lin Chugui attempted to coax her sister into meeting for a heart-to-heart, -heart, but Lin Zhenmi, citing her busy schedule, declined. These insights shed light on the concealed anguish in their lives, forming a critical part of the overarching narrative of this harrowing case. Ensnared in a devastating vortex of debt and despair, Liu Jiqin and his wife, Lin Zhenmi, tragically chose a path of irreversible darkness, the obliteration of their own family. Overwhelmed by an insurmountable financial crisis and seeing no viable way out, they resorted to a chillingly methodical plan. Lin Zhenmi meticulously acquired tape, rope, and other sinister tools from the supermarket, setting the stage for their grim plot. Four days before the grim reality came to light, on September 4th, their eldest son, not yet back in school, was at home. The couple sinisterly employed a poison extracted from a toxic vine, rendering him defenseless before taking his life and concealing his body in the third floor bathroom. That same evening, a similar cruel fate befell their fifth child, who had just returned from school and was about to have dinner. Their second child, returning late from school, was equally caught in this tragic web. Miraculously, the two middle daughters evaded harm on that fateful day. However, on September 5th, after the daughters, dressed in their school uniforms, left for school, their mother deceptively claimed their brother was ill with a fever. Upon their return and resumption of normal activities, Liu Jiqin and Lin Zhenmi heartlessly repeated their heinous act, ending the lives of their two daughters in the same cold-blooded manner. Lin Zhenmi then stoically cleaned the scene, disposed of the garbage, and encountered a neighbor, to whom she offered no response, retreating back into the shadows of her home. After executing these reprehensible deeds, Liu Jiqin and Lin Zhenmi absconded in their vehicle, leaving behind a shattered family legacy. A deep dive into the investigation unearthed a crucial clue on Liu Jiqin's computer. He had extensively researched the notorious Ho family case in Changhua from 2001, a case as shocking as it was unforgettable, and one that also commenced on September 4th, the same day the Liu family tragedy unfolded. This eerie parallel led investigators to speculate that Liu Jiqin might have drawn macabre inspiration from that case. The community, now enveloped in fear and dismay, was haunted by these ghastly events. Seeking solace, they invited priests to conduct rituals, 
hoping to find peace for the innocent souls of the children. The relentless pursuit of Liu Jiqin and Lin Zhenmi continued, with the police scouring tirelessly for leads that seemed to dissipate as quickly as they appeared. This case, laden with spiritual torment, posed a formidable challenge to the investigating officers, leaving an indelible mark on the hearts and minds of the community. Nine years after the unfathomable tragedy that struck the Liu family on June 10th, 2015, a profound discovery unveiled a new haunting aspect of the saga. In the Tsu Yun Mountains of Canale, a mere two Kaya from the Liu's former home, a hunter made an unexpected find. Traversing a secluded mountain path, he inadvertently stepped on what appeared to be a white object. Initially mistaking it for animal remains, he unearthed something far more chilling, a pair of shoes. The discovery prompted an immediate police investigation. At the scene, they unearthed two human skeletons, along with additional shoes, garments, and a pesticide box dated May 2006. Forensic analysis chillingly confirmed that the remains belonged to a male and a female with no apparent bone injuries. The cause of death was identified as pesticide poisoning, dating back approximately nine years. Amongst the corroded items, a pair of gold-rimmed glasses, strikingly similar to those once worn by Liu Jiqin, were discovered. DNA testing conclusively identified the skeletons as those of Liu Jiqin and Lin Zhenmi. On September 11th, 2015, the Hoalien District Prosecutor's Office officially announced the demise of the couple, previously suspects in the murder of their five children, effectively closing the case. Yet, this revelation opened up new lines of inquiry and speculation. Firstly, if debt was the driving force behind Liu Jiqin and Lin Zhenmi's actions, what led them to commit such a heart-wrenching crime? Secondly, if their initial intent was to murder their children before committing suicide, why did they choose a location away from their home? Thirdly, the rationale behind their decision to document the murder of their children remained shrouded in mystery. Fourthly, at the time of the incident, the influence of mafia groups on local authorities was noteworthy raising the possibility of crucial leads being obscured or manipulated. Fifthly, according to local reports, a mysterious individual was frequently seen near house number 25 in the days leading up to the incident, only to vanish following the discovery of the crime. While numerous questions linger, Casting a shadow over whether this was an act perpetrated solely by Liu Jiqin and Lin Zhenmi or involving a criminal syndicate, the truth remains elusive. In the end, the most heart-rending aspect of this case lies in the fate of the innocent children. We remember them, hoping for peace for their souls and praying they have found serenity and eternal rest.
Each evening, as I returned home, the shadow of my father's despair loomed large, anchored in the trouble surrounding my grandmother. It became clear that resolving these issues was imperative. It was unfathomable to me that even my mother harbored thoughts of ending her life. My father, in his despondence, questioned me. If he were to leave this world, would I follow him? He believed our family's reputation would crumble, leaving us, the three siblings, to face scorn. Yet I couldn't align with my father's bleak perspective. These words belong to Chengren, the youngest progeny of a Taiwanese billionaire dynasty. The entries etched in the pages of his diary mark the final chapter before a catastrophic event that claimed the family. Chengren's writings are a mosaic of intense emotions, enveloped in fear, engulfed by helplessness, and entangled in an internal conflict that plagued both him and his family. These entries serve as a critical revelation, an unseen facet of the iceberg, unearthing the hidden depths of one of Taiwan's most talked about billionaire families during that era. In the vibrant heart of Changhua, the Hong family resided as a pillar of influence and grandeur. Their magnificent mansion, sprawling over 3,000 square meters, was a symbol of their wealth and prominence. At the forefront of this esteemed family was the venerable Hong Yuba, a 51-year-old patriarch renowned for leading the Chung Guyen Company famed for its cutting-edge adhesive tapes and labels. His personal saga, as intricate as his business ventures, was marked by the joys and sorrows of two marriages. From his first marriage emerged three children. The eldest, Hong Song Fu, a 24, exuding maturity. The second, Hong Chengren, 23, thoughtful and reserved, and the youngest, Hong Meng Yu, 19, full of youthful vigor. A decade prior, Mr. Hong Yuba's life was cloaked in tragedy when his first wife tragically succumbed to a car accident. In the wake of such profound loss, he discovered solace and renewed joy in the arms of Diu Bao Yue, 48, thus beginning a new chapter in his life's journey. Mr. Hong was the epitome of precision and meticulousness. His garden, a testament to his exacting standards, featured trees lined up with military precision, each precisely 90 sima apart. His residence mirrored his methodical mind, a sanctuary of pristine order and cleanliness. This relentless drive for perfection shaped not just his home life, but also propelled his business success. Yet beneath his stern demeanor, Mr. Hong nurtured a deep sensitivity towards the emotional needs of his children from his first marriage. He and Mrs. Dew, in a unified decision, chose not to have more children, with Mrs. Diu undergoing tubal ligation in a profound gesture of love, fully embracing her role as a mother to his children. The Hong family, synonymous with prosperity, unity and bliss, was admired and envied by many. Together, the five members lived in what seemed like a perfect harmony. However, Fate had a cruel twist in store. Their once serene and opulent existence crumbled into a harrowing narrative, sending tremors of disbelief and horror through anyone who heard their tale. 
The journey of this seemingly idyllic family unraveled into a saga of unimaginable tragedy, forever inscribed in history as a poignant testament to the fragile nature of fortune. On the morning of September 5th, 2001, a day now etched in infamy, Tushuande, the respected general director of Chung Nguyen Company, embarked on a mission to Truong Tan Industrial Park. His objective was critical, to obtain the final endorsement from Mr. Hong Yuba, the esteemed founder of the company, on a significant monetary transaction. Mr. Hong's uncharacteristic absence and unreachable status that day cast a sinister veil over what should have been a routine procedure. Driven by the pressing urgency of the situation and unable to tolerate the gnawing uncertainty, Tushuande decisively headed to Mr. Hong's opulent mansion, intent on a direct confrontation. The estate typically safeguarded by two formidable hunting dogs, lay in an unsettling quietude, enveloped in an air of abnormal calm. Tushuande, arriving at the scene, found himself greeted not by the usual bustle, but by the resolute silence of sealed gates and unanswered calls. After a period of vain attempts at communication, Tushuande, propelled by a deepening sense of alarm, breached the perimeter fence and delved into the enigmatic realm of the Hong estate. The conspicuous absence of the usually vigilant dogs further heightened the air of mystery. Venturing through the verdant front garden and into the grand hall, Tushuande was met with a heavy, ominous silence, a stark contrast to the usual vibrancy of the Hong residence. The atmosphere was pierced only by the discovery of three unsettling suicide notes, ominously arrayed on the living room coffee table. Authored by Mr. Hong Yuba and addressed to Miss Hong Yu Yan, these notes unraveled a narrative steeped in despair and hidden truths. Wasting no time, Tushuande, recognizing the severity of the situation, promptly summoned the authorities. The stately Hong mansion swiftly became the epicenter of an intense and high-profile investigation as the police mobilized swiftly to dissect the enigma. Upon their arrival, the investigators stumbled upon a disturbing revelation. Each of the three notes, drenched in Mr. Hong's deep-seated sorrow, bore his own script. They voiced his pain over the perceived lack of trust and faith from his family, overshadowing the deep love and loyalty shared within his immediate circle. These letters laid bare Mr. Hong's harrowing decision to escape this world, plunging his story into a realm of darkness and despair. In the midst of the crime scene, a deceptive tranquility lingered. The absence of forced entry and the lack of foreign footprints painted a picture of eerie calmness. However, this stillness was abruptly shattered by a pungent, suffocating odor that led investigators to a colossal garbage incinerator sequestered in a remote corner of the backyard. Beside it stood a sinister grinding machine and a container of diesel fuel casting ominous shadows. The incinerator's door, slightly ajar, emitted a nauseating stench that grew more intense with each step closer, a sinister prelude to the grim discovery within. The incinerator's door, marred by dark burn marks, whispered tales of a fierce inferno. Inside, a haunting discovery awaited, a fine white powder, possibly the remnants of human remains, lay scattered, defying immediate identification. 
Adding to the eerie tableau, two pairs of slippers, one black, the other red, and of different sizes, lay forsaken, eerily pointing towards the incinerator as if drawn by a morbid magnetism. A bone-chilling sense of dread enveloped the investigators as they began to piece together the ghastly events that had transpired. Delving into the incinerator's mechanics revealed that it was still operational, its LCD display coldly illuminating a continuous high temperature cycle. The door, stubborn and unyielding, opened but a fraction as if determined to shield its macabre contents. The investigator's persistence unearthed a crucial clue, a tightly coiled steel wire rigged as a makeshift lock from within. With considerable effort, they forced the door open, unveiling a sight of unspeakable horror. Two charred bodies entwined in a grotesque final embrace. The bodies were tentatively identified as Mr. Hong Yuba and his wife, Mrs. Diu Bao Yue. In a cruel twist of fate, Mrs. Diu Bao Yue's body was charred beyond recognition from the neck down, while Mr. Hong Yuba's upper body, though severely burnt, remained oddly intact. Autopsy results painted a grim narrative. Mr. Hong's lungs were laden with carbon, a testament to his final desperate fight for survival, whereas Mrs. Diu's trachea bore no such evidence, suggesting she may have been already lifeless or unconscious before the blaze. Among the ruins, two glass bottles were found, one broken but still harboring a liquid heavy with anaesthetic properties. Further investigation revealed two pairs of shattered glasses belonging to Mr. Hong Yuba and Mrs. Diu Bao Yue. Yet, hauntingly missing from the scene were any signs of the three Hong children or family photographs, deepening the mystery. The catastrophic unravelling at the Hong mansion sent shockwaves rippling through the community. Onlookers gathered, some scaling fences for a closer glimpse as Mr. Hong Yuba's mother, overwhelmed by despair, collapsed at the sight. The downfall of the Hong family not only convulsed the local community, but also sparked a whirlwind of public intrigue and speculation. Lingering in the air was an ominous question. What truly transpired within the walls of the Hong residence? What secrets lay behind the children's disappearance and the true essence of these tragic deaths? Huang Wenjin the skilled artisan behind the installation of the massive garbage incinerator at Mr. Hong's estate, vividly recalls the significant day of August 3rd, 2000. On this day, Mr. Hong, known as Hong Yuba, approached him with a substantial sum, 500,000 Taiwanese dollars, roughly equivalent to 16,000 USD, tasking him with setting up an incinerator by August 25th, Huang Wenjin had meticulously assembled the massive structure in a discreet corner of Meister Hong's expansive backyard. Throughout the installation, Huang Wenjin became intrigued by the incinerator's colossal size. Upon querying its purpose, Mr. Hong nonchalantly mentioned its use for incinerating coconuts and animals. However, the subsequent request, made just two days after the installation, was far from ordinary. On August 27th, Mr. Hong requested additional features, a mechanism to delay ignition and a door that could be locked from the inside. By September 1st, these unusual modifications were complete. The concept of a self-locking door on an incinerator of such magnitude capable of containing four adults and reaching an astonishing 1,200 degrees Celsius 
was not only technically challenging, but also raised red flags for Huang Wenjin. He couldn't shake off his skepticism. It was utterly bizarre. My initial survey of the area revealed no necessity for such large-scale incineration. The investigative team's probing unearthed a sequence of disturbing events leading up to the incident. On August 23rd, it was revealed that Mrs. Diu Bao Yue, the children's stepmother, had informed them of their grandmother's passing, necessitating a journey to the countryside for the funeral. Alarmingly, by August 31st, classmates were unable to contact Hong Songfu, the eldest son. The family assured the school of Songfu's return the next day, but he remained absent. The mystery deepened on September 4th, when Mrs. Diu Bao Yue, speaking to a friend of Hong Meng Yu, the youngest daughter, claimed to have taken her on a trip. In the early hours of September 5th, a CCTV camera captured Mr. Hong Yuba's car leaving the residence at 4.30 a.m. and returning at 9.47 a.m. These haunting images possibly marked the last moments of Mr. Hong and his wife shrouded in enigma. Delving into Mr. Hong Yuba's professional life, investigators uncovered the dire financial crisis engulfing Chung Nguyen Company starkly contrasting its previous successes in the paper and self-adhesive labels industry. A notebook found in the company's office laid bare Hong Chengren's, Mr. Hong's introspective second son, inner thought. His writings revealed Mr. Hong's regrets about expanding the company with a new factory at Truong Tan Industrial Park a decision that initiated a downward spiral after years of flourishing. The financial predicament worsened as details of Hong Yuba's desperate attempts to salvage his empire emerged. He accumulated debts surpassing six million, an endeavor that proved futile. His financial maneuvers extended to borrowing eight million USD from the Ni Lam branch 2.4 million USD from private sources and an undisclosed sum from underground banks, all leveraged against the company's assets. Despite these troubles, Mr. Hong Yuba's actions on May 3rd perplexed investigators. He and his wife withdrew an eye-watering 700,000 USD for debt repayment, and later that day, a close friend received 47,000 USD from Mr. Hong, highlighting his frantic efforts to manage over 10 different loans. In confidential discussions, Hong Yuba revealed a dire contingency plan, the potential liquidation of personal assets to settle his enormous debts. Further amplifying the financial strain, Hong Chengren's credit card balance plummeted from 170,000 to just over 100 yuan, a stark indicator of the family's deep financial woes. This convergence of financial desperation and drastic actions raised a pressing, ominous question. Did the burden of debt drive Hong Yuba to a fateful decision regarding his family? Or was there an external, shadowy influence behind this tragic sequence of events? In the depths of their comprehensive investigation, the discovery of diaries belonging to Hong Meng Yu, the youngest daughter and the family's second son, painted a vivid picture of the turmoil within the Hong family. Meng Yu's diary entries laden with remorse for not extending holiday wishes to her father, peeled back the layers of familial chaos and emotional unrest. Her musings reflected on the prospect of ending their discord, casting doubt on whether her family could ever attain genuine happiness. Changren's diary entries, previously unearthed, resonated with similar themes of familial discontent and disarray. The seeds of conflict were deeply sown, as evidenced by the frequent complaints of Mr. Hong's mother to neighbors, 
She accused Mr. Hong Yuba of misappropriating the family's fortune, further straining the ties between Mr. Hong and his relatives. The investigation deepened as more disquieting evidence surfaced. In the private quarters of the youngest daughter and the son, investigators stumbled upon sinister small bloodstains concealed beneath their pillows. Near these unsettling finds, a syringe and an electric baton were recovered, along with tracks indicative of a heavy cart's use, suggesting Mr. Hong's involvement in ominous activities. A thorough examination of the incinerator, which led to the recovery of the couple's remains, also revealed additional ashes. DNA tests confirmed that these belonged to Mr. Hong's two hunting dogs, adding another layer to the unfolding mystery. The scope of the investigation widened to include all five luxury cars at the mansion. Particularly, the Cadillac presented curious evidence beach sand on the pedals and an enigmatic fine powder inside, though the trunk divulged no further secrets. Determined to uncover the full truth, the investigative team mobilized friends and family of the Hongs, initiating a thorough search of the garden, fearing the worst for the three children. Despite their exhaustive search efforts, no conclusive evidence was found underscoring the complexity of the case. The investigators then pivoted to meticulously connecting and sequencing each event to reconstruct the entire story. Their narrative traced back from August 3rd to the grim completion of Mr. Hong's large incinerator on September 2nd. Alarmingly, he first experimented with it using his pet dogs. Efforts by family friends to contact the son and youngest daughter were met with dubious responses from Mrs. Dieu, raising suspicions about their safety. It increasingly appeared that between September 2nd and 4, Mr. Hong had used syringes and an electric baton to control his children. He then reportedly transported their bodies to the incinerator using the cart before grinding their remains into ashes. In a final macabre gesture, Mr. Hong and his wife scattered the ashes at the beach. On the fateful morning of September 5th, Mr. Hong Yuba's actions culminated in a tragic finale. After sedating his wife and placing her in the incinerator, he administered sedatives to himself and entered the incinerator. The internal lock mechanism of the incinerator necessitated a makeshift steel wire to secure the door, but the sedatives hastened the incinerator's timer, igniting an immediate, intense fire. Tragically, Mr. Hong was trapped, enduring the unbearable heat in a final, desperate embrace with his wife's body. This theory, while speculative, is rooted in the understanding of Mr. Hong's personality, a man driven by perfectionism, rationality, and control, but whose pursuit of perfection revealed a dark, extreme side of his character. It paints Mr. Hong Yuba as a conflicted figure, torn between his need for control and a deep-seated cruelty, ultimately leading him to make a harrowing decision that engulfed everything he held dear, including his true love and innocent children, in a tragic act of finality. An Indonesian woman has been jailed for 20 years after being found guilty of killing a former classmate with cyanide-laced coffee. Jessica Kamala Wongsu, who's 28, was convicted of murdering Wayan Myrna Selahin at a Jakarta cafe in January. 
The court heard that Wong Su was angry that Salah Hin had suggested she break up with her troublesome boyfriend. Wong Su's lawyers say they will appeal the verdict. Jessica Wongso, born into Jakarta's elite on January 5th, 1988, was the treasured youngest child of Imelda and Winner Wongso, famously known as the Plastic King. The Wongsos, distinguished by their extravagant wealth, ran one of Indonesia's leading plastic import empires, positioning them at the apex of the country's distribution sector. In stark contrast to the average Indonesian earning just dollar four a day, Jessica's upbringing was a tapestry of opulence and extravagance. In 2005, the Wongso family expanded their horizons to Sydney, Australia, a strategic move for their flourishing business. They settled in the prestigious harbour suburb of Double Bay, where they acquired an impressive estate epitomized by two vast adjoining land parcels. Yet, Jessica remained in Jakarta to complete her high school education, surrounded by a retinue of caretakers and staff. From a tender age, Jessica's world was colored by her love for video games and a remarkable artistic flair, often losing herself in hours of drawing. This creative passion steered her towards a future in graphic design. After graduating high school in 2007, Jessica ventured to Sydney to reunite with her family, enrolling at the esteemed Belly College of Design. Despite her siblings' presence in Australia, their paths seldom crossed, each leading their own separate lives. College life for Jessica was vibrant and full of energy. She quickly became known among her peers for her playful, lively nature, always ready to sprinkle a bit of fun into any situation. It was during this time that Jessica's path intersected with Wayan Mirna Salihin, a fellow Indonesian and kindred spirit from an equally affluent background. Mirna's father, Edi Salihin was a revered businessman. Mirna, balancing her life between a twin brother named Salihin and a committed relationship with Melbourne-based Arief Somarko, studied in Sydney. United by their love for design, a zest for independence and powerful personalities, Jessica and Myrna formed an inseparable bond navigating university life as close friends. Jessica Kumala Wongso and Wayan Mirna Salihin, though woven from similar social fabrics, were a study in contrast. Jessica, effervescent and loquacious, thrived in the limelight, making her the life and soul of every gathering. In contrast, Myrna, with her shy demeanor and modesty, sought solace in simplicity and the quiet corners of life. Myrna's family, a tight-knit tapestry of affection, was a stark contrast to Jessica's more independent streak. Myrna, the very embodiment of grace and poise was always enveloped in an aura of love and care. Their university years brimmed with indelible moments. Alongside classmates Haney and Vera, Jessica and Myrna, both hailing from affluent backgrounds, navigated their student days as international learners. As time marched on, their graduation day heralded new beginnings. Myrna, hand in hand with her boyfriend, returned to the familiarity of Jakarta, while Jessica, embracing the unknown, chose to forge her path in Australia. In June 2015, the call of nostalgia saw Myrna journeying to Sydney for a holiday, 
rekindling cherished friendships and rediscovering the city's charms. Years rolled by and paths diverged. While Myrna basked in the glow of a blissful engagement, Jessica's life was shadowed by challenges. Her job in New South Wales was marred by a tumultuous relationship with her boyfriend Patrick, whose troubling habits and violent tendencies plunged Jessica into a spiral of depression and despair. Concerned, Myrna reached out with heartfelt advice for Jessica to sever ties with Patrick, but her words did not resonate as hoped. Tensions peaked during a shared meal, erupting into an argument that led to Jessica's silent, unannounced departure, a poignant end to their once vibrant friendship. Thereafter, Myrna resolved to meet Jessica only in the company of others, the ease of their solo interactions lost. November 2015 witnessed Myrna's dream unfolding into reality with her idyllic wedding to Arief Suamako in Bali, an oasis of joy and celebration. Meanwhile, Jessica's life continued its downward spiral. An alcohol-fueled car accident in August 2015, though harmlessly resolved, was not her first brush with legal and mental health woes. The relationship with Patrick deteriorated further, culminating in a restraining order against her for relentless harassment of him and his family. Increasingly reliant on alcohol and grappling with job loss, Jessica's life was marked by anger and disillusionment, escalating to threats against her manager and his mother. Ultimately, bereft of reasons to stay in Sydney, Jessica made the somber decision to return to her homeland. Her intentions shrouded in a veil of mystery and speculation. In early December 2015, a digital reunion was orchestrated by Jessica Wongso who initiated a WhatsApp chat group with Hani and Myrna. Like Myrna, Hani resided in Indonesia. Despite the lingering unease from their previous encounter, Myrna swayed by Jessica's repeated pleas and the knowledge of Hani's involvement reluctantly agreed to a meeting. Jessica's enthusiasm permeated the group chat and she eagerly took on the role of organizer coordinating the meetup and inquiring about drink preferences. Myrna, expressing a fondness for Vietnamese iced coffee, insisted on placing her order upon arrival. The reunion buzzed with excitement and warmth as old friends reunited. Yet this joyous atmosphere was abruptly shattered Merely moments after sipping her coffee, Myrna's demeanor shifted dramatically. She leaned back, a precursor to a sudden and severe medical emergency. What followed was a scene of utter dismay. Myrna, convulsing and frothing, was swiftly enveloped in a medical crisis. Chaos erupted in the cafe as this frightening scene unfolded. The staff and manager sprang into action, desperately attempting to assist, while Hani frantically tried to revive Myrna, to no avail. Amidst the panic, an ambulance was summoned and an oxygen tank appeared. Onlookers were paralyzed with shock, all except for Jessica, who maintained a strangely composed demeanor amidst the turmoil. In a flurry of urgency, Hani informed Arief Soamako, Mirna's husband, of her critical condition. Arief, stricken with panic, raced to the hospital, only to face a heart-wrenching reality. It was too late. 
Despite the doctor's best efforts, Myrna could not be saved. For Arief Somarko, this was an unimaginable tragedy. Just two months post their blissful wedding, his cherished wife was no more. They had envisioned a future teeming with dreams and shared aspirations. Myrna Salihin's life came to a sudden end at 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday, January 6, 2016. Her demise left her family and friends in a state of disbelief, struggling to comprehend the loss of a vibrant, young and seemingly healthy woman. Memories of her dreamlike wedding, celebrated just two months prior, were now painfully juxtaposed with the grief of gathering around her coffin. Myrna's untimely death not only plunged loved ones into deep mourning, but also left behind a trail of unanswered questions and profound mysteries. At Myrna Salihin's funeral, amidst a sea of mourners, Jessica Wongso's behavior stood out starkly, weaving a tapestry of doubt and scrutiny. In stark contrast to the collective grief, Jessica's demeanor was marked by an unsettling unease and a conspicuous absence of tears. Her atypical comportment raised a flurry of questions. Why had she been so adamant about inviting Myrna for coffee, and why the peculiar insistence on ordering it 45 minutes prior to their meeting? Further deepening the mystery was her choice of a strategically obscured table and her deliberate placement of three shopping bags to block a second camera's view. The narrative took a more intriguing turn with the release of the cafe's security camera footage. While chaos and concern enveloped the scene as others rushed to aid Myrna, Jessica remained a distant, almost statuesque figure her lack of movement suggesting a foreknowledge of the tragic events unfolding. The air of suspicion surrounding Jessica intensified when police investigations revealed that the coffee consumed by Myrna contained a lethal concentration of cyanide. In Indonesia, a country where the predominantly Muslim population seldom practices autopsies, the police faced the delicate task of seeking the family's consent for a post-mortem examination. Initially hesitant to subject Myrna's body to this procedure, her family ultimately acquiesced, permitting the collection of samples for analysis, albeit foregoing a comprehensive autopsy. Ahead of their 5 p.m. meeting, Jessica arrived at the cafe an hour and a half early, her movements calculated and observant. She meticulously surveyed the cafe, her eyes tracing the angles and blind spots of the security cameras. Eventually, she settled on table number 54, strategically positioned next to a wall and largely hidden from the prying eye of the first camera, while the second, across the room, offered only a distant view. After reserving the table, Jessica briefly departed, only to return laden with three shopping bags from the body shop, ostensibly containing soap gifts for her friends. These bags were then strategically placed to further obscure the camera's view. At the bar, Jessica's order was precise, two cocktails and one Vietnamese iced coffee, all paid for in advance, ensuring their placement behind the visual barrier of the bags. Once the server departed, Jessica subtly shifted her seating arrangement, maneuvering into the center of the crescent-shaped seat. Though the camera's clarity faltered, her hand movements did not escape notice. Intriguingly, 
Jessica's beverage of choice was a coffee milkshake cocktail, negating the need to manipulate the traditional coffee fin. Yet her actions suggested otherwise, subtly aligning with her elaborate scheme. Upon completing her preparations, Jessica discreetly stashed the bags behind the seat and reassumed her original position, leaving the Vietnamese coffee conspicuously positioned at the table's center. The arrival of Myrna and Hani at 5.15 p.m., delayed by a quarter of an hour, was met with Jessica's calculated welcome. The drinks, by then, had been awaiting their fate for over 45 minutes. Myrna's body language, tinged with discomfort, betrayed her unease. As Myrna settled between Jessica and Hani, Jessica swiftly directed her attention to the Vietnamese coffee, urging Myrna to take a sip. The ensuing reaction was immediate and alarming. Myrna's instinctive hand wave and her voiced repulsion to the coffee's taste marked the culmination of Jessica's plan, where a mere sip harbored lethal intent. This near flawless execution of Jessica's plan, shrouded in the guise of an epileptic seizure or sudden death, almost evaded suspicion. However, a crucial slip in Jessica's facade occurred at the moment of Myrna's crisis. Her hasty accusation towards the cafe staff for tampering with the coffee sparked confusion and suspicion, inadvertently highlighting a key piece of evidence. The subsequent autopsy unveiled a grim discovery, traces of cyanide in Myrna's stomach, coupled with bleeding. This revelation, fortified by the cafe manager's swift preservation of the coffee cup, cemented cyanide as the lethal instrument in this tragic narrative. The case sent shockwaves through Indonesia, capturing public attention like a sensational Hollywood thriller. Swirling amidst the shock were speculations ranging from jealousy to complex romantic entanglements. In a pivotal turn, Indonesian authorities sought collaboration with Australian law enforcement, delving into Jessica's past. Her Australian records painted a portrait of a troubled history, marked by threats and aggression. This international police cooperation opened new investigative avenues under the proviso that Jessica, if convicted, would not face capital punishment. A critical question loomed large. How had Jessica acquired cyanide, a substance not readily accessible through legal channels? Many hypothesized a clandestine purchase on the black market yet concrete evidence of such a transaction remained elusive. On the 15th of June 2016, a somber six months following the abrupt loss of Mirna Salihin, the trial of Jessica Wongso commenced. This case, steeped in shock and intrigue, riveted Indonesia. Jessica, stepping into the courtroom, presented a demeanor that defied the gravity of the situation. Her absence of remorse or sorrow was as striking as it was unsettling. Treating the swell of attention not with the sobriety of a defendant, but with the air of someone basking in a personal triumph. In the courtroom, Jessica's presence was paradoxically luminous. She greeted the assembled press with broad smiles and confident waves, as though relishing her role at the center of this legal drama. Throughout the trial, her composure never wavered. She faced the judges with unshakable confidence, an aura of certainty in her innocence. 
Her defense was bolstered by a formidable legal team comprising over 15 of Indonesia's top lawyers, a testament to her family's considerable wealth. The defense's strategy hinged on technicalities and conjecture. They argued the absence of cyanide in Myrna's liver, lungs and urine, positing that the trace amounts found in her stomach might have been a post-mortem occurrence. They contended that without a comprehensive autopsy, which was not performed, the true cause of death remained speculative. Adding to the controversy, Jessica became a sought-after guest on television shows. Her appearances fueling public outrage and further complicating the narrative. Public opinion swirled with theories about Jessica's mindset, with some speculating that she was blinded by her family's affluence and a misguided belief that money could eclipse justice. Others pondered if the comfort of her privileged incarceration eclipsed the hardships faced by the impoverished outside prison walls. Yet, in the end, the scales of justice tipped on October 5th, 2016, as the final verdict echoed through a packed courtroom, a nation watched with bated breath. Jessica was found guilty, sentenced to 20 years behind bars amidst a wave of applause and sighs of relief. In accordance with an earlier agreement with Australian authorities, the death penalty was off the table for Jessica. This saga left a lasting imprint on the collective consciousness of Indonesia. It served as a stark reminder that wealth cannot shield one from personal tribulations or moral accountability. In an unexpected twist, Vietnamese iced coffee, a minor detail in this tragic tale, soared in popularity across the city's cafes, becoming a bittersweet symbol of the case that had gripped a nation. In the heart of South Korea, as twilight descended upon the streets, a seemingly routine scene unfolded. A high school girl, embodying youthful exuberance, made her way home. Her steps were carefree, punctuated by a light-hearted skip, while her suitcase trailed behind her, tapping a rhythmic beat on the pavement. To any casual observer, this was the quintessential close to an average school day, an everyday sight in the bustling life of the city. However, lurking beneath this facade of typical teenage innocence was a harrowing truth, starkly contrasting with the girl's jovial demeanor. Unseen by the passers-by and hidden in plain sight, this ordinary tableau was, in fact, the opening act of a dark and sinister narrative. A plot most foul was brewing in the shadows, a premeditated scheme of murder veiled behind the ordinary, transforming an unassuming evening into the backdrop of a chilling thriller. In the hushed early hours of July 2nd, 2023, the serene streets of Busan, South Korea, bore witness to an enigmatic encounter. A night shift taxi driver, navigating through the tranquil city, picked up a passenger who was as elegant as she was mysterious, clutching a heavy suitcase. Her youthful appearance suggested she might have just stepped out of a school gate 
The eerie silence of the morning was so profound that the soft rumble of the taxi's tires on the asphalt seemed unusually loud. The driver, curious and slightly bemused, speculated she was perhaps en route to the train station or the airport at this ungodly hour. His assumption was shattered when she requested to be taken to a location far from the ordinary, the deserted, shadowy banks of the Nakdong River. A sense of dread crept up on the driver as she pointed out a particularly isolated spot for him to stop. A dense, forsaken forest along the river, its darkness only broken by the towering weeds. Suspicion mounted when he noticed bloodstains on her suitcase, adding a sinister edge to this already strange encounter. As the girl stepped out of the taxi and disappeared into the tall grass, the driver, gripped by uncertainty and fear, remained at a distance, his eyes following her every move. Compelled by a mix of concern and fear, he made the decision to alert the police. In the agonizing wait that followed, the driver's mind raced with unsettling thoughts. What could be the reason behind her bizarre behavior? What secrets did that blood-stained suitcase hold? Unexpectedly, the girl re-emerged from the thicket before the police arrived. The suitcase now seemed eerily light and empty. The driver, unable to hide his anxiety, informed her of his call to the authorities. Her response, however, was unnervingly calm, devoid of any signs of haste or worry, deepening the mystery surrounding her. When the police finally arrived, they were greeted with a palpable tension in the air. The driver recounted every detail of his strange passenger and her peculiar actions. Upon examining the suitcase, the police found fresh, uncoagulated blood, adding an intense urgency to the unfolding situation. When questioned about the blood, the girl nonchalantly claimed it was a result of her menstrual cycle an explanation that seemed implausible to everyone present, only adding to the air of mistrust. Concerned about her mental state and the potential dangers it posed, the police promptly called for an ambulance. Ensuring her immediate medical attention became paramount, not just for her safety, but perhaps to prevent any further unforeseen actions in her current unstable state. As the first light of dawn illuminated the Nakdong River, a team of police officers embarked on an extensive search of the untamed grasslands nearby. Their investigation led to a chilling and macabre discovery. Dismembered body parts cunningly concealed within the underbrush, a revelation that left them in utter disbelief. The focus swiftly shifted to Jong Yu Jung, a 23-year-old woman whose actions the night before had raised suspicion. Her possession of a mysteriously heavy suitcase and her peculiar behavior had now placed her squarely at the center of this grim investigation. Brought in for interrogation, Jong Yu Jung initially wove a web of deceit. She first attributed the blood on her suitcase to a natural cause, claiming it was menstrual. However, Realizing the futility of this explanation, she shifted her narrative. She spoke of a tumultuous relationship with her boyfriend and a child born out of acceptance, leading to its abandonment. The plot took a darker turn when the police revealed that the remains found were of an adult, not a child and the suitcase contained personal items not belonging to Yung Yu Jung. 
Confronted with incontrovertible evidence, she desperately concocted another tale. Changing her story yet again, Jung Yu Jung claimed she had planned to visit a tutor's home for extra lessons on the fateful day. As per her new account, she arrived to find her tutor being assaulted by an unknown man. Jung Yu Jung portrayed herself as a victim, coerced and threatened with death if she did not assist the mysterious assailant in disposing of the body. Despite her alleged predicament, she couldn't convincingly explain why she hadn't contacted the police after the incident. Under the relentless pressure of interrogation, Jung Yu Jung ultimately presented a different explanation, alleging she hadn't reported the crime due to her inability to clearly identify the attacker. The investigation then turned to identifying the victim from the contents of the suitcase. The deceased was soon identified as Che Un, a 26-year-old student living in a rented apartment in Jumjong District, Busan. Upon visiting Che Un's apartment, the police made another gruesome discovery. Part of her body, accompanied by fresh bloodstains, was found on the premises. The crime scene was immediately sealed off for a detailed forensic examination. This examination revealed a pivotal piece of evidence. Only the fingerprints and DNA of Chayun and Jung Yu Jung were present, eliminating the possibility of a third party's involvement in the crime. Che Eun, a 26-year-old university student in Busan, was renowned for her calm and compliant demeanor. Throughout her educational journey, she remained harmonious and amiable, avoiding conflicts and strife with her peers. Beyond the academic realm, she juggled part-time jobs at local restaurants and eateries, striving to supplement her student budget. Recently, Cheyun discovered that tutoring offered a less demanding alternative to her restaurant work and afforded her greater flexibility with her schedule. Embracing this newfound opportunity, she signed up as a tutor on a widely used app in South Korea. Known for its intuitive design, the app showcased profiles of tutors complete with photos and detailed information, simplifying the process for parents seeking the ideal educational match for their children. Cheun's venture into tutoring was a step towards new prospects, unaware that this path would steer her towards an unforeseeable and tragic fate. On the other side of this story was Jung Yu Jung, born in 1999, whose life was marked by early adversity. She experienced the departure of her mother at a tender age of one, followed by her father's abandonment when she was six. Her upbringing was left to her grandfather, who, despite his efforts, could only cater to her basic needs, leaving an emotional chasm unfilled. To her neighbors and acquaintances, Jung Yu Jung was the quiet girl next door, seldom engaging with others. Friendships eluded her, and her social interactions were minimal. The significant age gap with her grandfather meant a lack of mutual understanding and empathy, rendering her innermost thoughts and feelings a mystery to those around her. Former classmates recall Jung Yu Jung as being distant and aloof, commanding a presence that deterred any form of bullying. Academically average and socially isolated, she navigated her school years in solitude, feeling increasingly detached from those around her. Returning to the enigmatic case, the DNA found at the crime scene belonged solely to Che Un and Jung Yu Jung. 
This revelation deepened the mystery as the police struggled to ascertain Jung Yu Jung's culpability in the absence of any discernible motive. The absence of any known link between Jung Yu Jung and Che Un further muddled the investigation. As the inquiry progressed, it became a labyrinth of complexity, with no additional leads shedding light on the circumstances surrounding Che Un's untimely demise. In the wake of several days marked by intense investigation, the police turned their full attention to the thorough interrogation of the sole suspect in a chilling case, Jung Yu Jung. Initially, the detective's objective was clear, unravel the mystery of the true perpetrator behind the crime. There lingered a possibility that Zhong Yu Jung, in a state of panic, might have overlooked the real murderer, or perhaps she was coerced into silence by a more sinister force. Yet, as the layers of the investigation unfolded and the interrogations intensified, a staggering and spine-chilling truth emerged. There was no hidden mastermind, no other hand behind the curtain of this gruesome act. The unsettling truth lay bare before them. Jung Yu Jung herself was the orchestrator, a figure so cold and calculating that she seemed to embody the very essence of a demonic presence. Her motivation was not born out of necessity, revenge, or any discernible rationale. Shockingly, her drive to commit such a heinous act stemmed from a perverse curiosity a desire to delve into the experience of taking a life, driven by nothing more than a twisted sense of intrigue. Jung Yu Jung's descent into this macabre mindset perhaps began after she graduated high school. Facing the void of unemployment, she found solace in the dark corners of crime investigation shows and crime literature borrowed from the depths of the local library. This relentless consumption of detective stories and criminal psychology might have been the catalyst that warped her perception of reality, steering her towards the execution of her own criminal plot. On May 25, 2023, Jung Yu Jung put into motion a plan that had been brewing in the recesses of her mind. Her strategy was cunning and calculated, leveraging her extensive knowledge garnered from the crime stories she had absorbed. She understood that a random crime would complicate the task of tracing the perpetrator. Masking her true intentions, she crafted a fictitious persona on a tutoring app, posing as a parent in search of a tutor for her daughter. Her target was Che Un a proficient English tutor who caught her attention on the platform. Jung Yu Jung fabricated a story about a 14-year-old daughter needing English lessons. Che Un, initially hesitant due to the distance, found herself persuaded by Jung Yu Jung's skillful manipulation and even subtle inquiries about her living situation. Unaware of the ominous intentions lurking behind these exchanges, Chae Un consented when Jung Yu Jung suggested bringing her daughter to Chae Un's residence for the lessons. It was at this juncture that Jung Yu Jung identified her prey and meticulously mapped out the dreadful act she was about to commit. The fateful evening of May 26th saw a deceptive visitor at Che Un's door. Clad in a high school uniform, the supposed student gently knocked around 6 p.m. Che Un, anticipating a tutoring session, opened her door, oblivious to the danger that stood before her. 
The person masquerading as a high school student was, in fact, the 23-year-old Jung Yu Jung. Once inside, she quickly assessed the situation, and upon realizing Che An was alone, seized her chance to strike. The weapon, cunningly concealed within her guise, was swiftly employed in a brutal, unforeseen attack. The autopsy report painted a grim picture. Che Un had endured over 20 severe wounds, predominantly targeting her neck and chest. Caught off guard and defenseless, she stood no chance against the ruthless assault, culminating in her tragic demise. In the aftermath of the murder, Jung Yu Jung's response was unnervingly composed. There was no hint of panic or the instinct to flee. Instead, she calmly vacated the crime scene, methodically progressing to the next phase of her ghastly plan. Her first move was to return home, retrieving a large suitcase. She then visited two supermarkets, purchasing cleaning supplies, bags, and various items necessary for the disposal of the body. Her actions, captured in clear detail by surveillance cameras, showed a person neither burdened by worry nor stress. Her demeanor was unsettlingly serene, almost as if she were preparing for an ordinary journey rather than the aftermath of a cold-blooded murder. Returning to Che Yun's home, Jung Yu Jung undertook the gruesome task of dismembering the body. She methodically partitioned Che Yun's remains, placing portions in the suitcase. She then embarked on a grim mission to dispose of the body. Dragging the suitcase to various locations before returning home to collect and pack the remaining parts. In the dead of night, at 3 a.m., Jong Yu Jung hailed a taxi, the suitcase, now a macabre container of her crime, in tow. She disappeared into the night, searching for a secluded spot to finalize her sinister disposal, leaving behind a trail of shock and horror that would resonate long after the case's conclusion. In the stark confines of the detention center, Jung Yu Jung presented an unnerving calmness her demeanor starkly contrasting with the severity of her situation. She exhibited no trace of distress or panic, an anomaly that baffled the police and obscured the true intentions behind her heinous acts. Through relentless interrogations, Jung Yu Jung eventually unveiled the sinister motive behind her actions. She chillingly confessed a desire to experience the act of murder firsthand. Further, she revealed her fascination with a 2012 Korean film titled The Train, which depicted the harrowing tale of a young girl trapped in a life of suffering due to her parents' deaths. The movie's protagonist, in a desperate bid to escape her tormentors, assumes a new identity. She exploits her job to target and befriend vulnerable women living alone, eventually usurping their identities in a twisted quest for a new life. Jung Yu Jung's execution of her crime chillingly mirrored the plot of this film, transforming its fictional narrative into a grotesque reality. She meticulously crafted her criminal plan, drawing inspiration from the dark themes and characters she encountered in her cinematic escape. An examination of Jung Yu Jung's mobile phone revealed a startling isolation, not a single contact with classmates or anyone else in the five years since high school. Her contact list was a void, a stark testament to a life lived in solitude ensnared in a web of her own morbid thoughts and fantasies, blurring the lines between reality and fiction. 
When details of the case and its gruesome nature were publicly disclosed on June 1st, 2023, they sent shockwaves through the Korean community. The brutality and horror of her actions painted her as a figure of terror and bewilderment in the public eye, many perceiving her as deeply disturbed. On the morning of February 6, 2023, as Jung Yu Jung was escorted to the prosecutor's office, she was met with a barrage of media attention. Encircled by a sea of reporters, her response to their queries was disquieting. I don't think I'm insane. I sincerely apologize to the victim's family. Professor Lee Sang Hoon, a renowned criminologist from Keo Sang University in Busan, expressed his concerns about Jung Yu Jung's potential as a serial offender, if not contained. He noted the rarity of such a gruesome and unprovoked crime committed by a woman against another woman. Li Shou, a forensic psychology professor at Kim Chi University, weighed in with his analysis. He observed that unlike typical criminals who exhibit confusion or fear, Jung Yu Jung's demeanor was eerily devoid of such emotions. He posited that she might suffer from a personality disorder which could account for her alarmingly composed behavior during the crime. As this captivating and unsettling case awaits its final judgment, its developments continue to grip the nation. We commit to providing timely updates in our community section, ensuring that our audience remains informed about the ongoing proceedings of this extraordinary case. Chinese national who killed three women in a flat in Yishun four years ago has been sentenced to death. Wang Zhijian was tried for the murder of his lover, Madam Zhang Meng, her teenage daughter, Feng Jianyu, and their flatmate, Yang Jie. 46-year-old Wang was found guilty of culpable homicide not amounting to murder for two charges and guilty of murder for one charge. He also slashed Madam Yang's daughter, Li Mei Lin, who was 15 years old at the time of the incident. One night, One night, as my, my mother, mother and I slept, slept, we were we startled, startled awake, awake by screams for help and choking, choking sounds. sounds. Suddenly, Suddenly, a man, man burst into my room and began, began stabbing, stabbing me. me. My, mother my mother escaped, escaped outside, outside, but he, he followed, followed and threatened, threatened me. me. In, in an, an attempt, attempt to secure myself, myself I, kicked I kicked him and hid in the bathroom. bathroom. But he but broke, broke in and continued his attack. This is Lee Malin's account the sole survivor of a horrifying murder in Singapore that claimed three lives and left a blood-stained scene. Today, we delve into what triggered this dreadful event. In the dead of night on September 18, 2008, Eerie, dim lights cast ghostly shadows within the 12-story apartment complex at 349 11th Avenue in Ngi Thuan District, Singapore. Suddenly, a desperate cry for help pierced the silence from Building 3, 49, jolting the residents from their slumber. Frantically, they threw open their windows searching the dark for the source of the disturbing noise. Peering into the impenetrable darkness, 
the residents could barely make out any shapes, the lack of light blurring everything into obscurity. The cries for help had ceased, but this brought little comfort to the onlookers, now gripped by an unsettling curiosity. Just as they began to close their windows, a thunderous crash echoed, suggesting something heavy had plummeted to the ground. Below, under the faint glow of streetlights, a crowd's gaze was drawn to the first floor walkway. A wave of shock washed over them as they spotted a motionless figure lying on the concrete, dark liquid pooling around it, painting a scene of horror. In a state of alarm and fear, the residents retreated to their rooms and hastily dialed the police. Responding at 050, the Ungi Thuan District Police arrived, ready to unravel the mystery. The initial investigation revealed a middle-aged woman clad in nightwear, lifeless on the open lower floor of the building. With no clear indication of which apartment the woman had fallen from, the police embarked on a meticulous search, descending from the twelfth floor to the ground level, tracing the precise spot of her fall. Their investigation took a turn upon reaching the sixth floor, where a room bore faint red smears, possibly blood, on its door. Communicating through silent, meaningful glances to avoid causing a stir, the officers, bracing themselves for a grim discovery, knocked on the door. After a wait punctuated by faint noises from within, a tall, well-dressed man in his forties cautiously opened the door. The lead investigator probed, There's been a fall from this building. Can you tell us which room the person came from? Did you hear anything unusual? The man, cutting off the inquiry, claimed, I was just in the shower, and moved to close the door abruptly. His behavior immediately raised red flags among the officers. Guns drawn and ready, they commanded. Don't, Don't move. move. Hands, Hands up. up. We need, we to, need search to search the premises. The premises. Cooperate, Cooperate, or we'll or be, be forced, forced to, shoot, to shoot, they declared firmly, guns trained on the middle-aged man. Reluctantly, with visible hesitation, he raised his hands in surrender. Spotting bloodstains at the door, the police had already called for backup from the SCDF, who arrived promptly. Cutting through the bloodied iron door, the team prepared for the worst. The first step inside revealed a ghastly tableau. Blood was splattered across the floors and walls. An ajar kitchen window hinted at a possible escape route or point of the fatal fall. Venturing deeper into the apartment, the officers approached the farthest of the three bedrooms. The door swung open to a gruesome sight. A middle-aged woman's lifeless body, about forty, lay naked in front of the bed, covered in dozens of stab wounds. Her lower half bore the brunt of a frenzied attack. Nearby, another body, a younger woman lay sprawled with multiple stab wounds in her abdomen. Initial forensic analysis suggested a total of 98 stab and slash wounds on both victims. A bloodied serrated knife, the possible weapon of the crime, lay abandoned on the bedroom floor. The officers, proceeding with caution, inspected the remaining rooms before reaching the attached bathroom. Blood was everywhere. A kitchen knife and a soaked belt were found in the washing machine, silent witnesses to the carnage. In the bathroom, they found a young woman, barely clinging to life, with a meat cleaver by her side. They rushed her to the nearest hospital for urgent care. The scene left the Ngi Thuan District Police in shock. Three dead, and one fighting for her life. The sole man in the apartment, unscathed and freshly showered, stood out with his right index finger oddly bandaged, 
adding to the mystery of that tragic night. The investigation swiftly sprang into action, with the police zeroing in on a towering figure, suspecting his pivotal role in the tragic demise of three individuals. The suspect, a 42-year-old Tianjin native named Wang Zhijian, who had ventured to Singapore on a short-term visa, found himself under the intense scrutiny of a comprehensive police inquiry at the station. In their quest for clarity, the authorities pieced together the identities of those entwined in this dark tapestry. The ill-fated woman who met her end after plummeting from the sixth floor was Yang Jie, a 36-year-old from Shenyang Liaoning, employed in clerical work at a private firm. A mother of two, her younger daughter resided in Dalian, China, with a new partner. Meanwhile, the other daughter, Li Meilin, merely 14 and grappling with life-threatening injuries in the bathroom, was a student braving the rigors of high school. Another piece of this grim puzzle was Zhang Meng, 41, also hailing from Tianjin like Wang Jijian, discovered lifeless under the bed. Accompanying her in this tragic fate was Feng Jianyu, 17 years old, her own flesh and blood. The lives of Feng Jianyu and Li Meilin were intertwined by friendship and their shared journey of studying in Singapore. This connection had led Zhang Meng to open her home to Yang Jie and her family. Yet, amidst these familial ties, Wang Jijian stood as an enigma. Neither a part of Zhang Meng's nor Yang Ji's family, his presence in the apartment raised a myriad of questions. What were his ties to the four victims? What chain of events led to this heart-wrenching catastrophe? These were the perplexing questions the police were determined to unravel to shed light on this harrowing case. The interrogation of Wang Zhijian, born in 1966 in Tianjin, China, began with a meticulous probe into his past and present circumstances. Unemployed at the time, Wang Zhijian delved into his complex history with Zhang Mang, a relationship that originated in 1996 in a brokerage firm in Tianjin. There, amidst the hustle of stock trading, a colleague introduced him to Zhang Meng. His past also included a tenure as a supervisor at a Tianjin port in 2004 and a divorce from his former wife due to irreconcilable differences. A pivotal moment occurred in November 2006 when Zhang Meng's husband confronted Wang Jijian, forcing Zhang Meng to choose between them. She chose Wang. Following her divorce in 2007, the Zhang family began a campaign of harassment against Wang Zhijian, marked by physical assaults and death threats, even at his workplace. This harassment culminated in Wang Zhijian's early retirement, along with a settlement of 400,000 CNY, approximately $55,000. This background set the stage for further complexities. Wang Jijian recounted how, in the early stages of their relationship, he lavishly spent a quarter of his savings on designer clothing and extravagant meals for Zhang Meng. However, the tide turned when her ex-husband had a stroke, leading Zhang Meng to end their relationship and return to her former spouse. Yet, in a twist of fate, merely four months later, Zhang Meng and her daughter moved in with Wang Jijian.
The saga continued as Wang Jijian catered to their needs, once splurging $140 on a crab meal at a seafood restaurant before returning to Tianjin. Zhang Meng soon beckoned him back, suggesting employment opportunities through her connections at a logistics company. In a subsequent visit on August 3rd, Wang Zhijian encountered agents demanding fees for job placement, but Zhang Meng refused to cover these costs, sparking numerous disputes. Another call from Zhang Meng on September 2nd informed Wang Zhijian of her daughter Jian Yu's school change, prompting his return to Singapore after withdrawing dollar 970, almost his entire savings. Within three days, he exhausted dollar 280, including dollar 120 on a crab dinner for Zhang Meng and her daughter, a meal he barely shared. Wang Zhijian's narrative took a bitter turn when he described his living conditions. He recounted to the police with palpable anger, I had, I had no, no money, money left, left for crap. crap. All, All my, my funds, funds went, went to feeding them. them. I, prepared I prepared their meals while surviving, while surviving on leftovers, leftovers washing, washing all their clothing, their clothing by, by hand, hand including, including their, their underwear. underwear. I was, I was confined, confined to the bedroom, the bedroom naked, naked, as Zhang Meng forbade me to leave in the presence of her daughter and other tenants. With no bathroom access, I resorted to using plastic bags and newspapers for my sanitary needs. I endured, I endured in silence, silence fearing, fearing even, even harsher, harsher treatment. treatment. Zhang, Zhang Meng's, Meng's aggression, aggression even extended, extended to biting me. me. This harrowing account painted a picture of a man pushed to the brink, living in deplorable conditions under Zhang Meng's strict and unusual rules, hinting at a deeper, more complex web of emotions and motivations behind the tragic events that unfolded. Wang Zhijian's account began with a seemingly mundane disagreement that rapidly escalated into a night of terror. Around, Around 8, 8 p.m. On, on September 18th, 18, he recounted, Zhang Meng entered, entered my room, room craving, craving crab, crab once, once more. more. I, reminded I reminded her of the recent indulgence, indulgence pointing out the over dollar 100 I had already spent, spent on their last crab, crab feast. feast. A heated, A heated argument, argument erupted, filled, filled with, with harsh words, words and insults. insults. She, belittled she belittled me, comparing me to the lowest of animals. Her words ignited a fury within me, a resentment for all I had sacrificed. As the night deepened, the tension in the room became palpable. Wang Jijian lay awake next to Zhang Meng, his mind racing with the day's confrontations. A suffocating pressure filled the room, he described, my body shaking with rage. My thoughts spiraled out of control, haunted by the betrayal and the unjust way Zhang Meng had squandered my savings. In a fit of anger, Wang Jijian rose and entered the kitchen. The sight of the uneaten seafood, left unrefrigerated, symbolized the decay of their relationship. In a moment of uncontrollable rage, he seized a kitchen knife. Describing the attack, he said, the knife, the knife became, became an extension, an extension of, my of my wrath. I plunged, I plunged it into Zhang Meng's abdomen, abdomen unleashing, unleashing a frenzy of stabs as her screams, screams echoed in the room. room. My, my rage, rage was relentless. relentless. Even, Even as Jiang Yu entered the room, room I, couldn't I couldn't stop myself. myself. Overcome, Overcome with blind, blind fury, fury, I attacked I her too. too. However, Wang Zhijian's narrative began to unravel under forensic scrutiny. DNA evidence on the knife contradicted his claims of attacking Yang Jie and Li Melin. Confronted with these inconsistencies, he altered his story. Realizing the gravity of his actions, Wang Zhijian recounted his hasty attempts to erase the evidence. In a, In a daze, daze, I hid, I hid the, the kitchen, kitchen knife 
aimlessly grabbed a belt and threw it into the washing machine. I then armed myself with another serrated knife, he admitted. His recount continued with a chilling detachment. I found Yang Ji and Li Meilin in another room and attacked. When Yang Ji fled, I realized she was gone. Unable to find her, I turned my rage towards Li Meilin, who had sought refuge in the bathroom. Despite her efforts to barricade herself, I broke in and grievously wounded her. Preparing to flee, he cleaned the weapons and himself, only to be interrupted by a knock at the door. The police had arrived. When queried about Yang Ji, he coldly responded, I didn't, I didn't harm her. her. I'm, not I'm not responsible, responsible for her, her death. death. But the evidence suggested otherwise. Investigators found signs of a desperate struggle, with Yang Ji likely trying to grasp something for support before her fatal fall. Li Mei Lin, the sole survivor and Yang Ji's daughter, vividly described the harrowing ordeal corroborating the evidence of her mother's struggle and her own near-fatal encounter. The bloodstains on the iron door hinted at Wang Jijian's frantic escape attempts after the gruesome act. The underlying motives for Wang Jijian's heinous act became more evident, symbolically etched into the ink of the three tattoos on his body each a testament to his turbulent relationship with Jiang Meng. Wang Jijian consistently claimed his mind had succumbed to a void during the attacks, alleging a total loss of memory regarding the assault on the four victims. He professed ignorance of his own actions unable to explain the presence of the knife or the ferocity unleashed, particularly towards Zhang Meng and the others. Psychiatric evaluations hinted at Wang Zhijian grappling with an adjustment disorder marked by uncontrolled, rage-filled outbursts. However, subsequent investigations painted a different picture, suggesting premeditation. Wang Zhijian's calculated composure while erasing traces of the crime, methodically bathing, removing bloodstains and plotting his escape, sharply contradicted his claims of a memory blackout. This disparity in his narrative and actions intensified suspicions about his intent and preparation for the crime. His demeanor during the pre-sentencing period only solidified this perception, as he exhibited unabated aggression, attacking a fellow inmate in a display of raw brutality. Yet, what truly unsettled observers was Wang Zhijian's demeanor post-arrest, a confident, almost contented smile, as if his heinous acts were a cathartic release a liberation from a deep-seated loathing. This eerie satisfaction provoked a wave of online outrage, underscoring the depth of Wang Jijian's insensitivity and cruelty. On November 30th, 2012, the courts found Wang Jijian guilty of murdering Yang Ji and the mother-daughter duo, Fang Jian Yu. He filed an appeal on September 7, 2013, seeking to overturn the verdict, but to no avail. On November 28, 2014, the appellate court in Singapore upheld his death sentence. Two weeks following the tragedy, on October 2, 2008, the three victims were laid to rest. Among the mourners was Yang Jie's daughter, Li Mei Lin, still recuperating and visibly traumatized. The incident left her battling an overwhelming fear of darkness, a physical and psychological scar marking a poignant shift in her life. Once a place of promise, Singapore had now become the backdrop to her deepest sorrows and mental anguish.